A seasoned pilot takes off from a quiet mountain airport, just like he'd done countless times before. But minutes later, his aircraft vanishes into the rugged New Mexico terrain. Now, the NTSB's preliminary report has revealed some truly unsettling details, from unexpected route changes to rising terrain and storm cells closing in. What really happened to November 5009 Bravo, and why did a routine flight turn fatal so fast? Let's break it down. The aircraft involved was a Beechcraft F-35 Bonanza, registration November 5009 Bravo, a well-known high-performance single-engine aircraft from the post-war era. The F-35 Bonanza is often praised for its speed and range, but also demands respect, especially in challenging conditions. This particular airplane was being used under Part 91 rules, which means it was a personal, non-commercial flight. The pilot, Mario Acosta was 64 years old and based in Eagle Nest, New Mexico. He had a routine. Every few weeks he'd fly between his home in Eagle Nest and his work near Hobbs over 200 miles away. It wasn't just a one-off trip. This was something he'd done many times before, and he knew the area well. That familiarity may have added a layer of comfort, which, as we'll see later, can sometimes lead to unintended risk. On the morning of July 6th, after spending the July 4th holiday with his family, Acosta planned to return to Hobbs. Knowing the airport would close early on Sunday, he fueled the airplane to capacity, 28 gallons added. He also took time to perform some maintenance on the nose gear strut, which reportedly had a slow leak. This wasn't unusual, according to his wife, and was part of his regular pre-flight routine. So far, everything was in order. He knew the airplane, he knew the route, and from a mechanical standpoint, he seemed to be doing everything right. But as we'll talk about next, nature doesn't always care about routine. This is where things get extremely complicated, and frankly, a little unsettling. When the pilot arrived at Angel Fire Airport just after noon to depart, his family noticed something alarming. Thunderstorm clouds were building up on nearly every side. According to his wife, the north, east, and west were surrounded by towering cumulonimbus clouds. These are the huge vertical clouds that can mean serious turbulence, lightning, downdrafts, and even hail. The south, she said, was obscured by a wall of gray. That alone raises a big question. Was this a day to be flying at all? Now, the pilot reassured his family. He told them he was monitoring the weather using ForeFlight, a popular aviation app used on iPads and tablets that can show radar, meters, and storm cells in real time. He said that if conditions became unsafe, he'd simply return to the airport. Let's pause here for a second. This is a really important topic. Foreflight is a phenomenal tool, but it's not foolproof. It relies on either Wi-Fi or cellular data. When airborne, unless paired with a satellite ADSB or weather receiver, the data can lag by several minutes or more. And in mountainous areas like Angel Fire, where radar coverage and cell signal can be spotty, that delay could be even worse. What you're seeing on your screen may not reflect the current conditions around your aircraft. That's not a knock on foreflight, just a limitation pilots need to keep in mind. To make things more confusing, the official weather observation at the time reported visual meteorological conditions, good visibility, light winds, scattered clouds, Technically, it was legal to fly, but legal doesn't always mean safe. And here's where it gets really tricky. Those towering clouds visible to the eye didn't show up in the immediate surface weather report. This is a classic case of what you see versus what the instruments say. For non-pilots watching, this is why situational awareness matters so much more than just reading the numbers. You can legally take off, but still be headed toward danger. And unfortunately, this situation was shaping up to be just that. So, now let's talk about terrain, because this is where the situation really turned deadly. Angel Fire Airport sits at 8,380 feet above sea level, already a very high elevation by most flying standards, but more importantly, it's located in a narrow valley surrounded by peaks 
climbing up to over 13,000 feet. To the east, you've got Mount Baldy at 11,700 feet. To the west, Wheeler Peak at over 13,000. That means once you take off, you're immediately boxed in by rising terrain on all sides. Under normal conditions, the pilot's go-to route was smart. Head north briefly toward Eagle Nest Lake, then follow Simarin Canyon eastward, which offers a natural path through the terrain, gradually descending out toward the plains. It's a known route, and one that offers a safe corridor with more room to maneuver. But according to the NTSB's early findings, and based on where the wreckage was ultimately found, the pilot didn't follow that usual route. Instead, he appears to have turned east too early, flying straight into a narrow mountain cut near Simarancito Peak, without the benefit of the canyon's gradual descent. That area, tragically, is what's known as a box canyon. For non-pilots, here's what that means. Imagine flying into a U-shaped valley that closes off at the far end. If you realize too late that you can't climb fast enough to escape, or don't have enough room to turn around, you're trapped. There's literally nowhere to go. Now, why would he do this? It's possible he was attempting to divert around storm cells, maybe trying to stay visually clear of threatening clouds he saw to the north or west. That would make sense, especially if those towering clouds we mentioned earlier looked menacing. But by turning east earlier than usual, he may have inadvertently flown into terrain that didn't give him any escape options. The wreckage was discovered on a 30-degree slope at nearly 10,000 feet elevation, just two miles west of Samaranchito Peak. The pattern of damage, severed treetops, fire-consumed wreckage, and the compact debris field suggests a high-energy impact, possibly following a failed attempt to turn around. And if you're thinking, why didn't he just climb over it? Well, that leads perfectly into the next section. One of the most unforgiving aspects of mountain flying is density altitude, and it played a huge role here. At the time of departure, surface temperature at Angel Fire was around 23 degrees Celsius, or 73 degrees Fahrenheit. Combine that with the airport's high elevation, and you're looking at a density altitude, essentially the effective altitude as far as the airplane is concerned, of well over 10,000 feet. For the non-aviators, as density altitude increases, air becomes thinner. And when the air is thinner, the engine produces less power, the propeller is less efficient, and the wings generate less lift. So even though you're on the ground at 8,300 feet, your aircraft is performing as if it's already at 10,000 or higher. That's a massive hit to climb performance. And here's where it gets really crazy. Many pilots assume they'll be fine if they're under max gross weight or if they've flown the same aircraft at altitude before. But on hot summer days, the margin shrinks dramatically. You might only be climbing at 200 to 300 feet per minute, even at full power. That's not enough to outclimb rising terrain, especially if you're in a confined space with nowhere to turn. It's also worth noting that this Beach F-35 was fully fueled that morning, so while we don't know the total weight on board, it was likely near the upper end. Combined with the thin air and high terrain, that creates a scenario where performance margins vanish fast. This is one of those harsh aviation truths. The aircraft doesn't care how familiar the route is. If it physically can't climb out of a terrain trap, that's the end of the story. And tragically, this may have been one of those moments where an unexpected route change, combined with poor climb performance and surrounding terrain, left no way out. One underappreciated detail in the preliminary report is that the aircraft's ADSB system hadn't been consistently working for months. That meant after takeoff, there was no radar or real time tracking. No way for anyone to monitor the plane's exact location. And when the pilot didn't arrive, the wreckage wasn't found until two days later. While this didn't cause the crash, it's a serious reminder that real-time visibility matters, especially in remote, mountainous terrain. Modern tracking tools like ADSB Out aren't just for airspace awareness. They're a lifeline when things go wrong. The pilot also relied on foreflight for weather. That's common and often helpful, but there's a real risk in assuming tablet-based tools tell the whole story. In rugged regions with spotty coverage, weather updates can lag and radar imagery might not reflect what's right in front of the aircraft. So the broader point here, technology is a great assistant, but a poor replacement for on-the-ground judgment, especially when storms and mountains are in play.
At the end of the day, this was a flight flown by a pilot who knew the route, the airplane, and the airport. Mario Acosta wasn't inexperienced or reckless. That's what makes this crash especially hard to process, because so far, nothing in the preliminary report suggests a single catastrophic failure. Instead, it looks like a combination of marginal weather, unforgiving terrain, and limited climb performance, all converging at the worst possible moment. And that's what we, as a community, need to reflect on. Not to place blame, but to take away real lessons. This case reinforces a few things we can't afford to forget. Terrain doesn't forgive miscalculations. Performance charts aren't suggestions. And just because a flight is familiar doesn't mean it's safe today. The NTSB will continue to investigate and will wait for the final report. But even now, we can choose to learn and stay vigilant on every single flight. Let me know what you think. Could this crash have been avoided? What would you have done differently? Drop your thoughts in the comments. And if you want more early analysis like this, as NTSB reports continue to come in, hit subscribe and stay tuned. Fly safe, and I'll see you in the next one.